pleased to introduce uh, Matt Eyre, Senior Lecturer in Mining Engineering, and Herman Aguirre to take us through a, a PhD study into fleet management and the low-cost internet of things. What we're going to talk about today is um, a larger PhD study, which is Herman. Herman's one of uh, mine and uh, Declan's PhD students. As Brian said, I'm a senior lecturer at Campbell School of Mines in mining engineering and then brackets intelligent mining. So it's, it's a bit of an oxymoron of a title, but that's me. And then I'll let Herman introduce himself and then we'll, we'll go on to the talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Herman Aguirre, mining engineer from Chile, a former director of operation management in Codelco, one of the biggest copper producers. And I am working with Matt in this intelligent concept of mining. So uh, what we'll do in this talk today is talk about a system we've designed as part of uh, Herman's PhD, calling it a fleet information uh, system rather than a fleet management system because it, it doesn't have an aspect of dispatch. But basically what we're trying to do is use low-cost IoT concepts to build systems which give us comparable data to commercial fleet management systems at very low cost. So this particular system we're going to talk about today, we've deployed it at Greystone Quarry in Cornwall for aggregate industries to capture some data and proof of concept uh, in order to get loading, uh, load counts, cycle times, truck and shovel positioning, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll, we'll go into more detail with that. The IoT concept, it's a very small uh, microcontroller, which has a GPS sensor, but also an inertial measurement unit which consists of um, free axis accelerometers, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more uh, detail in a moment. Free axis gyroscopes for heading information and free axis uh, magnetometer in order to get uh, reference to north in, in free orientations. It's got a barometer on board and also a thermometer. And the other key point is, is they all have uh, Bluetooth enabled. So it will pick up interaction and Bluetooth handshakes between different equipment, but also We've positioned Bluetooth beacons in certain places around the quarry, which then they can interact as it drives around. And, and we uh, utilize that on three primary movers, which were two wheel loaders and one excavator and two trucks. And we're just going to talk about how the system works and basically some of the data which we can pull off, it, pull off this system. Uh, this is the fleet we have selected, of course, in the aggregate industry where we were working with Brian. Uh, you can see here the kind of uh, loader we have uh, used, Caterpillar 972, Caterpillar 900G excavator. That can be quite familiar for you if, if you are working in a, in a query. Very nice track, Komatsu HD 465 and Caterpillar 772G. There is, a, there is a inside that says that the mining will improve uh, its productivity going, going bigger and happened through the times so over the last 30 years to improve productivity in large scale mines is try to make bigger or make a bigger capacity of equipment and happened the same with fleet management system. They, they, they started to be very specific, uh, quite expensive. And that is the reason here we want to show an alternative that uh, we can uh, compete against that and then try to demonstrate we can replicate some results. We have used this a very beautiful query. It's uh, here in Cornwall, Greystone uh, query. And here I really would like to thank to Brian uh, Wilshire and Lauren Nugent. Uh, they really helped us to install the system. Uh, the system had been installed in this query for six months. And here we will analyze a couple of days a uh, couple of weeks, uh, some uh, slides will show some analysis of, of a range of days, like a month. But let's say here, just to introduce what we are going to do. Uh, for example, this is a query. Yeah, this is a wheel loader. Uh, we, we could see uh, through our sensors. Um, processing, a cr crusher mainly, of course. And uh, in, the, in the upper part of the picture, you will, it's, it will be shown that here is the stockpile, OK? We will, we will discuss uh, every single point. The system, I think, uh, I, I wanted to display this, uh, this picture because it's, it, even it's not just small, it's, it's, it's quite beautiful. It's, ju it's just a credit card size board uh, that is uh, fixed with a Velcro. Uh, we didn't interrupt anything. Uh, we installed in one minute, maybe less, and it was connected to the cigarette light, light and the GPS. Uh, is plugged with uh, USB. And you can see here, 
we have placed uh, this board, the microcontroller with the sensors very close to the um, operator, try don't disturb anybody. And very important that was a line. We will explain why it's important to place a line with the body of the machine, okay? But here in the middle, a picture of GPS, uh, of course should be outside to try to capture the signal and we can store the information in the piece of equipment, okay? Uh, the most important is to highlight that it's a very cheap, here is in the case of the wheel loader 980G and it's, it's self-contained and we are working for future uh, delivery. Maybe it can be with a magnetic feeder. It will be even easier if we can connect in the future. The last picture when uh, we have been installing here in the Caterpillar, uh, Matt was there in the picture, a Yane in front of the operator, very close. Uh, we don't disturb them and the GPS outside of the machine. This is the sensor that you can see of our system. The other one is the IMU, uh, Matt will talk about it. Uh, this in the, it's inside of this, this, of this box, okay? That's, that's the, the system. Yeah, the, the other point to, to make is is currently the uh, we've obviously velcroed that into the internal of the cab, but what we want to do is is build this as a self-contained system that we can just attach it by a magnet onto the side of the vehicle, which is is going to come in later iterations. So at the time, this was uh, largely a proof of uh, concept uh, study and, and the way we've gone through. But the other really important fact is that we've put various Bluetooth beacons out, which are highlighted by these uh, yellow dots. So, for example, BB1, uh, which Herman is shown with a laser points now, is on the output feed of the plant. Then we've got BB2, which is the input of the crusher. And then we've got BB3, which is in the far west of the picture, which is access to the tipping area. And then what we've got is um, a number of colored ones, which is dark blue, which is by the canteen and, and, and lunch area. Yeah. We've got the ice blue, which we've actually located on the... Um, fuel uh, location storage area so we can use that interaction in order to identify fuel use and then we've put a green beacon on the entrance to the stockpiles these are battery powered very very low power and what we do is all we've done in in a lot of cases is just duct tape them or cable tie them to posts or or something similar and, and the idea is is as the uh, vehicle drives around the quarry it it basically has a bluetooth handshake between these different sensors and then we can begin to log the interactions. So we can see, for example, the number of times it's interacted with a fuel bay or in the canteen or on the crusher, but very, very low cost. Uh, these sensors are, these particular ones are very cheap. They're about five pounds each. So they're pretty much disposable and you could you know, ramp this up to any number of Bluetooth sensors based on what you want to do. In this case, we've obviously done it with six. What we want to do as a miners, First task, we will be always try to count loads, okay? We, will want, we wanted to calculate loading time, cycle time, and positioning. That it can be, it, it, for, for somebody, it can be very basic, but until today, this kind of technology has been just installed in large scale mines, or you have to pay a very large amount of money to have it, okay? And in the first table here, you can see table number one, we have mixed all sensors that Matt described in the previous slide. It means here is a one day, it's a 25 November 2019, for example, and it's the interaction between the Komatsu HD 465 and the Caterpillar, the excavator 352F. And what we have done here, it's we want to count loads in an open pit area, because in the future, we want to escalate this to the underground mine area. It means in the first stage, what we will present today, we will see how we can measure, how we can control loads using the GPS data, because we can capture the signal, beacon, Bluetooth, handshake signals, and the IMU, accelerometers or gyroscope. We have mixed everything of them. For example, we, we, we calculate if the Komatsu track was very close in the GPS point with the, with the excavator. At the same time, if the Bluetooth signal recognize each other with a handshake. Also, we have cross, for example, if the speed of track was zero 
and also with the gyro that we install in the excavator if if it's if it was swinging loading okay and considering everything we have counted for example for for that day 32 loads okay and that why it's very important to say this because this is the base this is the backup to simulate the same mine as an underground mine don't take into account the GPS data. Okay? In, the, in, the next, in the next slide, we will show how we can count the same loads not using um, GPS data. Okay? But in this case, this is the backup. We wanted to see for certain how many uh, loading, we, uh, lo how many loads we did, loading time, cycle time. And just, just Brian, that you are here, give you an example. For example, that day, the average was like a three point. 3.2 minutes each load, and the cycle time, it was 8.3 minutes, an average. Of course, that will change uh, relying on the configuration of your open pit, or your query. For example, what we were measuring in the previous table, all that day, the loads happen in this bench. You can see the excavator in blue uh, with the GPS point, and here, the pattern of the track moving uh, across the, the query, going to the crusher and coming back. This was the, the cycle time of that was 8.3 minutes. And uh, the loading time that is very close here, we can, we can see even we can see the pattern, for example, when the truck is spotting and is, is approaching the, the excavator, we can also analyze that, okay? This is a, this is a particular case, for example, at seven, uh, 9 a.m., 25 November, okay, it, it, it happened, it happened. The, the most important is we can achieve that in a, uh, with a low cost internet of things. And for example, we can start to analyze everything that we have installed in the mine. For example, at the beginning of the shift, we can see if the excavator was, was parked in that part of the query, moved to the bench after we can see uh, the, the red, dots, that is the track, uh, Komatsu, another one at the end of the crusher the processing plan, moving aggregates to the different piles in the stockpile. At the same time, all this system is checking for Bluetooth signals, okay? This is a complicated situation because we are in an open space area. It means sometimes the, the equipment not necessarily are very close to each other, but they, they can recognize in the future will not happen that because if, if in the future we apply this system to an underground mine situation, tunnels will cut that signal, okay? But just to learn, just to start, just to give you an approach, for example, this is the situation, near, near eight o'clock that day, probably the, the track, the caterpillar uh, was stuck more than normal, more, more than 30 minutes there. We can, we can start to ask uh, each other the status of the track or, um, analyze the effective hours, productivity, and, and many, many things, just looking this kind of data. To give you an example of that day, in other way, for example, here you could have a plotting result of loading time. Most of them, more than two minutes and less than four. You can see here, for example, I explained to you, sometimes was an interaction, was a recognition, a Bluetooth recognition, handshake, but probably they were not very close to each other. And we can see also that dots that can help you for other kind of analysis. And we can see, for example, after 3 p.m., something happened in our bench while producing. And we can have, for example, loading time above four minutes or even seven. We can ask, we can start to control the process or no, less than 100 pounds just installing this. Cycle time, the same here, all, all cycle time, uh, more than eight minutes, less than nine. And you can see this point, for example, 52 minutes, it's a, it's a problem. It was at nine o'clock in the morning, probably a problem with the crusher or simply I'm waiting for a new dispatch or order. Here at 12, we can, uh, we can see clearly uh, the lunch time uh, when the truck moved to that area, parked the car, went to the canteen, and that that's, it can be can be analyzed. What I would like to highlight here is, for example, you start with 8.7 minutes. Of course, it's a very small sample, but you start with 8.79, and at the end of the shift, maybe 
If you can control well, you can reduce that time to the 6.8, 5.2 maybe. Of course, the size of the material in the bench will help you, but all those things can be uh, uh, started to spot it with this analysis. Okay, so uh, what I'm what I'm going to talk about now is is the uh, IMU concept and how basically where this becomes a little bit more effective in terms of underground mines. So, what Herman's shown there is obviously we can plot the GNSS data pretty easily, figure out where the trucks have moved by just uh, plotting that over a time period, which is going to give you some information which is readily readily available from a, a cheap sensor. But where the real novel aspect of this is uh, utilizing the IMU. So on board, on board that microcontroller, we've, we've effectively uh, got an IMU. So an IMU is a inertial measurement unit for uh, those who don't know, which is made up of accelerometers and gyros. So an accelerometer, for example, is what flips your phone screen as you turn your phone through 90 degrees. It detects that there's been a rotation and from there the accelerometer makes that change so if we look at an accelerometer we can see that we can utilize it for uh, different sensing functions so one example i just said there was in terms of your tilt of your screen so the tilt of, of that uh, rotation in a specific axis and obviously if we're three-dimensional if i tilt this in any ori orientation it will still flip the screen so that's the utilization of the accelerometer where it's really key in terms of the fleet management concept which which we're discussing is that we can detect movement so if 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 a truck is moving in a specific direction we can see that there's obviously inertia being generated uh, we can look at the accelerometer and begin to plot the accelerometer over time and see where the truck has moved without gps so pretty good in terms of an underground mine we can begin to plot trajectories of, of equipment in underground mines and, and without GPS, so GPS denied environments. The other key point is vibration. So because accelerometers are pretty sensitive, if, if something begins to vibrate, we can see, for example, we stick this on the machine. The, when the engine is started, the machine begins to vibrate. So we know when the engine's actually running, when the engine's not running, and, and very other, various other options. Okay, the other key point is we can detect the fall. So if we look at the Z axis, if Z was pointing directly up from my phone, and this is why it's very important that we've aligned this with the axis of the truck. So what we look for is a Z axis fall, so a Z axis drop. And that indicates, for example, that the loader has dropped uh, material into the hopper. And that's, reduced, that's caused uh, inertia, which has then been sent by the accelerometer. And we just count the number of acceleration event, events in Z in order to verify the number of passes in a load to a truck. So very, very low cost. So for example, you know, in terms of the, the cost of them in a the phone, these chips are you know, a few pounds, not a lot of money. And that's why we can utilize them for low cost events. They're not very high accuracy, high position versions, which you might find in, in different applications, but we just want to keep it low cost and, and read the data in an intelligent way. The other fundamental component we're using in the IMU is the gyroscope. So a gyroscope is trying to record, well, it records angles in three axes. So if we were considering, and we looked at this missile, for example, and the X axis was along the whole body of the missile, we would identify a roll, which would be a rotation in the X axis. We could identify a change in pitch, which would be the Y axis, like Herman's demonstrating now, or well, the fundamental one and the really important one, which we're utilizing in, in this case, is your. So what, and that's a rotation on the Z axis. And this is very good, again, if we've got it well aligned in the excavator. When the excavator rotates after it's digging a bench and it rotates and it drops the material into the hopper, we can sense the number of passes from the excavator, which has gone across and dropped the material in. So we can count the number of passes per load, uh, a number of loads to fill the truck to let it go in a very low cost way. So it really makes it more intelligent than just using the Bluetooth handshake and the GNSS. And we can uh, load up different levels of data verification all the way down it. Here is because I am very happy because you re remember I explained to you the first tab table number one, we cross everything, GPS, Bluetooth signals, and IMU, okay. Let's transform this query in an underground mine, okay? And we will not use 
the GPS file to consider that. It means I will try just to determine the position, the activity, and if they are close to each other to measure that uh, information, if I can count the load. Remember something, in fleet management system until today, you have a touch screen in the cabin. And until today, because I, I work in consultancy and I know this pretty well, until today you have to match the, the shovel with the track to start to count things. For example, if I am in the commercial fleet management system, if I start to load a track, the first load is, is, is just in that moment, you start to count the loading time. And if you don't have a, a track ready to be placed to the next uh, load, that time is a delay. And that is the reason, that is the reason I think here we have a, a, something pretty interesting because we don't need those matches. I, we just need to read uh, if uh, the accelerometer is, for example, in the track, is a spotting and the swing and the vibration that Matt explained. And if you can see in this table too, this is the interesting of the, this presentation. It is the black records is exactly the same that I could measure with the GPS data. Not in this case, not considering GPS data. It means we could count 30, 30 of them. In the case of blue ones, the blue records is what I explained to you. We are in an open pit area, happen exactly the same activities when you load something. The, the shovel was swinging, the track was a, in speed zero or zero vibration and was waiting, but they were not close to each other, okay? And we replicate everything, but they were not loading. Why we know that? Uh, because uh, we are in an open pit area. Again, I, I would like to remark this uh, inside that will not happen in the in an underground mine because tunnels will break that that signal. Uh, blue two are omni uh, can can emit the uh, signal to all directions. Okay, these uh, blue uh, records are those one yes? interaction between machines, a handshake blue two signal, but they were not loading and we miss two. For example, in this specific day, it means. If we transfer this system to an underground mine environment, we can say, oh, of course, someone can say we can lose a little bit more, but with a 94% of efficacy, like we really are detecting with the sensors that uh, we install in the system. And that is pretty happy that I say thank you to, to Matt that teaching me this uh, kind of uh, piece of uh, electronic devices. And of course, thank you to, to, to put this in mind. Okay, that, that's, that's one point. So if I, I'll just break down, this is this is one particular load over over three minutes with an interaction with the the shovel and the Komatsu truck. And just to demonstrate what we were talking about before, so this is the compass setting, which is defined defined by the gyro and the magnetometer. But basically, as the shovel swings, we can see that there's a peak, and at that peak, that is the point in which the shovel is is dropping material over the hopper of the truck. And the bottom line, we can validate this with the orange line, which is the important one, that we look at the, uh, the compass data, in this case, of the truck. And as, as material is dropped into the hopper, it causes uh, the truck to shake, which shakes the compass, and then we get a peak. We can also validate this with the accelerometer data, like I said, with the fall. So what we do is we're adding multiple layers of, of different data analysis to verify the load has, has taken place. But in this case, we can see that there's a, a number of passes in that loading event. And from there, we can determine you know, the pass time. We can also, we can use this data in looking at like uh, diggability the material. On. So if we look at, look at just the uh, excavator now, you can see that there's uh, a number of passes uh, which have occurred. And if we look at the green circles there, they're actually the shovel which is digging the, digging the bench. To, to fill the bucket and then it, it'll load again. But what, what we can really do with this data is, is look at the excavatability of that material by looking at the variability in the dig rate of, of the shovel itself. And also obviously get your conventional uh, measurements, which are your uh, pass time and cycle time and load time, et cetera, all from the IMU data. So again, highlighting the point that we've got multiple uh, levels of sensing, which we can utilize for this case. Another important aspect again coming back to the gps is 
The image on the left-hand slide, which Herman's highlighting there, is a 10-minute period, and we can actually look on a, a macro set scale at what the shovel has been doing for those 10 minutes of, of it operating on that bench, along with, obviously, on the right-hand side, the three-minute loading time. So we can, we can utilize multiple layers of this data in order to really analyze and dig down quite literally into what's happening in that loading cycle. This has also been a, applied to the wheel loader, and, and this will look quite busy. Uh, I appreciate this. But what we can do with a wheel loader is we can look at this in, in this case is looking for stockpile measurement. So what we can do is we can look at in a, a density plot of um, locations in the GPS. So we, we know where the wheel loader has been operating in that day, what stockpiles it's been working. And the important fact in, in this case is in Greystone Quarry, external contractors come in with lorries to be loaded and obviously we couldn't put a system in each one of those lorries so it was essential for us to utilize the imu to know the number of uh, loads which are, are going on in that place so we could use this information in the top image for uh, reconciliation purposes and looking at stockpile management and, and material levels and then in the bottom image uh, where we look at the actual loading uh, side of the wheel loader it's slightly different analysis to the excavator basically two peaks in this this case two two compass heading changes actually equates to uh, one load with the wheel loader and if we go to the next slide i'll explain the reason why and this is because of the v pattern in which the wheel loader is operating so it it does one heading change to to load and turns around and does another heading change and then loads into into the waiting lorry or truck so one thing which uh, we haven't done yet, which we want to analyze in, in more detail, is really looking at that loading pattern and really uh, knocking down on the micro scale the, the, what we can obtain from these sensors in terms of that efficiency of that wheel loader in that sense, not just uh, counting loads and the number of which have been operated in terms of stockpile management. So there's multiple uh, layers in, in this data. It's really, really rich. So We've been recording the IMU data, at, I think we were recording it every millisecond, all the way for however long we were running it for, which is quite a, a considerable amount of data to go through. And what Herman's done is he's uh, wrote an, a number of programs now um, and scripted it all in R or in certain cases Python, that we can just generate the number of loads very quickly. So it reads this data and begins to begins to plot things automatically. So it's, it's now uh, got a, a bit more intelligence to it. Now we've we've proven the concept, particularly of this, this IMU uh, data, which we were unsure of, of because it was so low cost, whether it would work. Analysis for range of time, exactly. Remember something, remember something. It is, we are not relying on of operator. I don't wanna say that they are useful, useless or something like that. It's just, I want to say that I really want to measure carefully when the load happen or the cycle time happen, okay? And from a mining perspective, like, uh, okay, that, that is nice to understand the census, but of course we have to deliver something to the mine and really would like to give a good report. How said Matt, we have automated all the scripts. Now, just we can take the data and I can analyze per day, per hour, per second, per week, per month, and give you uh, an approach how you are performing. For example, I would like to see if in these three different days, for example, 7 November, 11, 12, uh, the pattern, the, the density, if you can see the density of the track using the road, uh, we can analyze traffic, for example, or loading points, the excavator where, where was placed, okay? Also the tipping points, if I am, if I am targeting well what, what I want to do to achieve the the week plan or the plan that I have uh, imposed myself or monthly, we can see uh, why we have to go to the bottom of the query. I don't know if it's necessary, question that we can start to answer looking this data. If, you, if we make a zoom in of this, you can see, of course, the excavator moving across the bench. That, that can help you also, for example, uh, we, can, we can cross the information with the block model. For example, if we have something and start to see the advance, the speed of the phase, we, we, we call it in Chile, like if we really are moving, how we should move our excavator. Okay, another loading point was pretty close to the crusher there, we will see, but mainly see the traffic, see how heavy can be, uh, or the roads, for example, we can predict 
it would be nice. That would be nice if we can predict uh, maintenance of the road because it can reduce the performance of your track. Yes, this is very important. This, this is something that I would like to receive always. I, I always I try to I try to create information if if I if I can use it in the future. And with the vibration, it's not pretty accurate, but with the vibration, we can start to understand how 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 long it was. Uh, turn on the machine, for example, and we can start to count effective hours or operative hours if, if the equipment were not doing the, the task, but at least we're waiting for something or in a delay, we can start to count this time. And also will be nice, will be uh, perfectly nice receiving the morning, for example, the first load if, uh, or, or the last load um, to start to uh, apply, for example, lean management or Kaizen, that can be quite useful to improve the hours that your fleet is being used. Okay, that way that that can be nice. Well, just to highlight, for example, seven six o'clock thirty in the morning, pretty early. I think that mine was pretty nice. Okay, uh, loading time, for example, for mine planners. I think this is quite useful if you don't have information at all, or or, or your information was to measure with a stopwatch. We can plot, for example, 300 points, we can plot six months, we can plot one month, whatever you want, and start to see the pattern. For example, here you have 200 loads, 250 loads, and we can really start to see, we can start to link, for example, the loading time with the excavator position, or for example, the road, it was pretty long, or the switchback, for example, if, if the road that truck took, and uh, had a lot of switchback, maybe we can uh, approach that situation, tackle some, some, some situation in the mind, and of course, improve performance and improve effective time. This is, this is important also. If you, want, if you really want to create a plan, reliable, that really you can achieve, measure your compliance with the mineral, uh, with the plan, for example, we can, we can see the, uh, the, the dispersion, for example, in this, uh, in this, in this mine. For example, it's the, uh, day number six loads, for example, between uh, six minutes and seven minutes, okay? Uh, number of loads uh, per day and loading time average. That's all. Matt, if you can tell me, please. Yeah, so uh, the other aspects we can look at is is obviously by plotting the excavator movement, we can look at the uh, development of, of the bench and the faces over a a period of time, which is going to help us in order to plan extraction and, and where we're going to move as, as we as we go on. So the three images here are just interactions between uh, Komatsu and the, and the cat, but it's primarily focused on the uh, shovel locations in those specific days. So we can dig, begin to monitor where the shovel's been. Then we can verify this, obviously, to maybe the excavatability uh, by looking at the uh, loading times and we can and we can do more analysis on on that shovel advance uh, do you want to go to the next one yeah just 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 to uh, so, sorry to dive deep here the point is the gps the the gps coordinate of the interaction and that can be uh, ratified after with a block model if we have uh, and see the quality of this part of the production yeah some videos here for example, yeah. it, it will be nice receiving in the morning. For example, if you are managing a mine, it will be nice, for example, receiving in the morning the position of your excavator in the morning. If you move, sorry, it can be, it can be sorry, like a surveillance, but we have to manage the mine. Okay. And at the end, where we are parking, because the most important delay in a mine until today, analyzing many mines around the world, is when we move excavator. If we move the excavator, we lose productivity, we lose production. I will not teach you that. I am sure you know that. But it will be nice to receive that alert, for example. Uh, let me go to the next one. Uh, just as a complement and to finish, it's, for example, the wheel loader moving across the stockpile. And what, how it's nice, this information, because at the end of the day, you really can see where you live. Yeah, just yeah, Matt explained this. I would like just to show you how we can plot the information. And, and that is it's pretty nice. We can see every pile where it has been left, the mineral. In, in terms of this case, and I spoke about it earlier on, is, is obviously we can do the density plots and the heat maps and various other things. But I think the, um, the sort of video analysis is quite good to analyze particularly where the wheel loader was um, all the time. 
Uh, and it's key, really, uh, where we couple this with the fixed locations of those uh, Bluetooth sensors. So we know when it was parked up by the lunch bay, for example, when the wheel loader was refueling, yeah. and then various other things. Basically, the, we've, we've done a fair bit with the data, um, and there's a lot more which can really be um, pulled yeah. out of these data sets. Because we've got, um, over the course of the period, we've got nearly 30 gigs worth of data to... Yeah to go through but obviously there's a lot of automated strips um scripts now which have been developed in order to process it very quickly and 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 utilize that data uh, effectively conclusions happy with this conclusion i hope you like the presentation but the conclusion we have here in front of us is the fleet information system design proudly at Cambor school of mine it can really a, a replicate important outputs of commercial fleet management system that is that is nice Currently available with many draw, draw uh, downsides uh, or many things that can be improved. Maybe just analyzing data we can improve with our system. Um, the fleet information system makes available data for research. That is important also because uh, academia lack information because when you are in a large scale uh, mine, ask, ask permission to request data for um, modular mining system, hexagon, lake, etc., will be always a nightmare. And that can be, maybe we can use as a research uh, to interpret tasks carried out at the mine site, specifically in those activities related to loading or hauling materials that we, where we are expert, okay? And the fleet information system enables a new approach because really until today, we rely on operators and a touch screen in the cabin. Okay, the, to assess the equipment performance, improving operational practices, because for example, when we are analyzing the wheel loader, uh, we can even analyze the angle and measure if we are doing well with our wheel loader. In a surface mining, the fish can rely on GNSS, how Matt likes to call this a GPS for people normal like us, we don't know very well, but GPS data, we can rely on that if, if, if we have GPS data, we have to use it. There can be pretty nice uh, results. This offer to both to the mining companies and the research team the possibility of achieving analysis in more precisely manner. This gives us confidence. Really, we are pretty confident to go to the underground mine and try to measure this. For example, in my case, I want to support my country. A lot of small mines, underground mine, for example, just one LHD, two, three trucks, they cannot afford to buy something this can be pretty nice tool, a new market, absolutely, for install our system. Uh, results and conclusion can be ta tailored for each mine. For example, aggregate uh, industry has a lot of multiple queries and we can maybe share benchmarking between them that very nice for operators also that can be done. These outcomes can unlock a new observation measuring activities that should impact the whole production results. This is our conclusions. In, in terms of future work, we've, we've touched on various different aspects. So we want to look at in more detail that IMU loading pattern, in particular that uh, dig rate of the excavator, for example, and, and, and can we correlate that to the excavatability or is, is operator skill? There's various different things we can uh, link and begin to simulate with those aspects. Another important fact is uh, with the IMU data now, what we're doing is, is we're streaming it as audio data. So uh, we're basically streaming it out as a wave. So what we're going to do is, is now apply uh, machine learning uh, applications. And much like you use speech recognition, so you know a speech, uh, me saying a certain word will have a certain peak and trough. What we're going to do is, is where we look at those excavator peaks and troughs, We'll train it as load, we'll train it as digging, and then it will be auto automated in order to go load and change the status as it moves down through. We want to transition to an underground mining uh, scenario. We have tested the, the sort of phase one of the system, if you like, in a mine in Chile. Uh, it worked pretty well, and we didn't experience the problems with the Bluetooth sensors, which we did from the surface aspect, which is a bit of lessons learned in that side. We do uh, want to establish on a cloud-based uh, system with uh, networking capabilities, but really at this point of proof of concept, we didn't want to pay for the data and the SIM card applications, but uh, it is available to do that. So what we were doing at the time was changing the SD cards in and out of the units 
just to capture the data. But now we're pretty confident in, in the way it works. It'd just be interesting to get more data and, and really see where we can push it. And we want to look at improving the Bluetooth sensors. So one thing which I've, I've been looking at programming, which I've been meaning to do, but the joy of online lecturing is taking a lot of my time up at the minute. But basically, we want to program those Bluetooth sensors to be directional rather than a solid omnidirectional signal. So we can look at the strength of the signal of the uh, machine. Say if it was on a higher bench, it would have a weaker signal strength. So and we can begin to discount those events previously. But that is our presentation. I think we've kept the time to 45 minutes. We're pretty much bang on the button, I think, and uh, that's it. So if you've got any um, questions, happy to take them. Hiya, uh, Clive Whittle here from Imaris. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Just wondering, because it's a low-cost system, there could be some benefits in looking at using this on forklift trucks and forklift loading, something I'd be interested in, in looking into. So although this is a Campbell School of Mines initiative, how are you going to market it and how would the – the, the mine owners or the, the people are interested in get in touch to well to trial it or to to purchase it um so obviously at the minute we, we do we established it as a as a research application as part of herman's phd um but yeah we're we're always looking to you know test it and and, and get more data so more than happy to put it on a forklift truck it would work uh, in exactly the same way um and yeah, really see where we go. We, like I say, it was a very much of a proof of concept. We, I didn't know, uh, considering the quality of the sensor, that we we would get the rich data which we have. Yeah. Um, and now we're just we've we've got the system, and it's a solution looking for a problem in in a lot of ways. So more than happy to test different things and and do that. Um, if you want to email me, contact me or Herman. I'm sure we can arrange something yeah. and and put them together. Not a problem. Okay, thank you for that. You talked about sort of scalability in terms of underground mines. Um, is that the is that the next phase for this year then, or uh, or is that sort of still still restricted by current uh, current events? Totally um, restricted by current events. We um, we were very brave with Matt. In a moment, we we went we had a system because Matt Declan they they, they taught me to do this, and we went to Chile immediately to try in a mine, but there we have some problems uh, with time series that is the reason we we are not showing that information but we have very valuable information there uh we test first in a in underground mine and but but after to, to to fail in many in many cases it was very painful i have to say but but very useful for future we decided to find something in a in cornwall with you thank you brian you, you for your for your help and definitely, if we can test again in the mine, uh, we are looking for an underground mine in the UK first, maybe. Yeah, it will be really nice, but COVID restrictions can be quite complicated. One of, one of the uh, uh, fundamental things we found with the uh, underground environment, which was really cool, was we were utilizing uh, pressure. So from pressure, we could determine uh, the depth, and then we could uh, literally plot and, and track the uh, movement of trucks down the decline. And then at the bottom of uh, the mine, we would put a, uh, one of our Bluetooth beacons in the truck waiting area. And then we could, if we had a number of interactions from different trucks, we would know that they were over-trucked or under-trucked if it wasn't enough. Uh, and it was, it was quite useful. Um, one of the issues we had is uh, with the time series, basically every time the system turned off, it didn't actually uh, wake up in the right time zone. So that was one of the problems we had, um, but we did get a lot of valuable data. Um, but now we've we've uh, actually sold it on. It was an oversight by me and Declan. I will admit that one. <laughs> sold it on a, um, a a clock correction on it now, which is is working well. Uh, and just well, well, one more for me. But in terms of understand the concept of the low cost system, are there are there already existing systems out there that you sort of based your ideas on? Are they something that you know might be might, might be attractive to our to our sort of SMEs and smaller members rather than the, the larger scale fleet management systems, which are generally cost prohibitive for a, for a smaller user. Yeah, so um, as with all research, there's a bit of a delay. We uh, 
thought about this proof of concept study, uh, waited for a while, and Herman applied, and then we were developing it. And then you might know the company Machine Max, uh, which have uh, developed uh, a system. It is it's very different. Um, but yeah, that come uh, probably in midway through the first year of Herman's uh, PhD. So I think I think uh, people are beginning to look at that. And like you say, um, it is cost prohibitive unless you sign up to a uh, a monthly um, subscription model or yearly subscription model with the equipment manufacturer. Um, so really, what we were thinking is, you know, we can replicate a lot of these things. Obviously, we don't have access to the to the CAN bus. So we can't um, we can't plug into the machine and read the vehicle diagnostic data uh, because they, they generally um, prohibit you from doing that. Uh, that's my next sort of idea of how can we uh, sort of crack that CAN bus, which yeah. I, you can do, um, but we just need to establish it. Let me let me add Matt try to answer also to Brian. I think our system has an advantage because I am I I don't want to say the other kind of technologies. Uh, are bad, but many of them are isolated. For example, you install something in a machine and you understand status of that machine. What I would like to propose is an environment, is analysis of environment situation, because uh, it's, it's, it's mix combined sensors to try to give you an approach really what is going on. With other kinds that is pretty useful also, if you don't have technology, or you don't have, for example, um, cables to send your information or any infrastructure to, uh, to put your technology. Maybe something that can stick in your equipment can be very valuable for sure. But I think uh, with a little bit more knowledge, you can start to combine many things and we can start to replace or recognize things. That is the, that is the reason I think we have a little bit advantage of doing this. Yeah. And then the <clears throat> the other point is we've processed this in all open source uh, data. So we, you know, we are, you know, from an academic point of view, we just, we want to be able to supply this to people um, and do it that way. I think it would be quite interesting. I've got a question, um, Brian, if you don't mind. Um, thanks for the talk, guys. Um, if you do sort of take this to a commercial level, what sort of platform do you anticipate the data being able to be viewed or analysed on? You know, for, for example, like a, as a mining engineer, how would I how would I view the data? Would it be spreadsheet based, or would it be on a dedica dedicated piece of software? You want to answer, Matt? I have an answer. Yeah, go. I can uh, answer. Yeah, well, but but as a miner, as a miner with operational experience, when you are in the shift. I think uh, uh, one boss said to me, my boots are my office, yes? And because your boots are your office, I think cell phone mo mobile friendly should be, definitely. And I think my, my criticism to the commercial fleet management system is they try to make business with license. They, they like to sell to you license and hardware. What I would like to do, uh, build something very light first that you can install very quick and the information directly to your phone. No license, web page based things. Uh, it's, it's more than 20 years of experience trying to, in mining industry in Chile at least, uh, selling license, nobody can access to the license. You have one license per mine, everybody start to share password. I think that business model is awful. I think really should be web based, definitely and uh, tailor it to yourself. If What you want to measure, you want to measure loads, go for loads at the beginning. If you want to measure I don't know, escapability, go for that first. I think should be randomized, um, oriented to your, what you want to see. It really should help you to manage the mind. It's my, it's, it will be our effort to do it. Uh, to add to it, yeah, once, once we've, uh... If we get, you know, it's quite easy for us to set up the um, GSM, so it, it begins to put the data over the mobile phone network. Uh, we haven't done that because I, I said obviously we'd have to pay the mobile phone contracts, um, but it, it's very easy then to link it to maybe IBM Watson, uh, and mm -hmm. then IBM Watson, you just log into an account and it will pop up whatever information you want, um, which is is what we can do quite easily. It's, yeah. it's not tricky to do. Yeah. 
Good question. Good question. Yeah. It's the output. It's finally the output and how you will use it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. And I, and I guess sort of along alongside uh, Alex's question, you, you come into the sort of the big the big data bit as well, don't you? In 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 that you say you generated what thirty gig of data in a, in a pretty sort of short trial period. If you're doing that day in day out. You know how how does that data then become sort of stored and 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 managed? Yeah, so linking to IBM Watson and the cloud um, is the uh, is a solution definitely. But, um, but but Brian, if you don't have money, I think Matt had an idea like uh, you can even put restrictions in the board and just to try to record what can be useful for you. Yeah, you can start to put, for example, I want to measure when the variation of accelerometer it is, I will record. But if no, I will not record. We can okay. save a lot of data doing that. It would be nice also. That's that's over the, the other point with the speech recognition stuff is obviously mm -hmm. we're we're putting this out, like I said, every tenth of a second or, or something stupid. But if we group that together and it's a word and that word is load, then all we do is say seven loads and that's the only thing which is transmitted from the unit you don't transmit all the all the bulk data um it was about I, I think it was about 30 gig on six devices over six months so it's not it's not masses it's not, of, yeah. of data yeah. and that's raw data um so yeah it's still quite light text format it's not yeah it's not that heavy okay well i guess yeah so measuring by exception would make that yeah. much larger again wouldn't it mm. okay yes Thank you both, Herman and, uh, and Matt. Really interesting. Really pleased to be involved in the project. Um, yeah, really, really key to sort of unlocking this um, technology and accessibility for for the SMEs and, and smaller quarry operators because it's just something that yeah, unless as you said, you've got the money and a big mining operation at the moment is just it's just not that available to have a, a system that you know links everything together. We've got you know new trucks that we can. Uh, glean more information from uh, than, than older trucks but the beauty of this system is that it's easily installed on a 775d or e as it is a 775 you know g just at the factory so it's it's fantastic and uh and thank you for that and thank you from your iq and um thank you everybody for attending <laughs>